Hello and welcome back to another IB History video. Today is the second video in the two-part uh, IB History case study edition of the Move to Global War. If your class or your school is doing the Move to Global War, these are great videos to review the topic, or if you've never learned about the topic in the first place, this is all also a great place to start. If you have questions by the end or in the middle of the video, I recommend you leave a comment or DM me if you know me personally. That way I can answer them and get back to you as soon as possible, especially because as I'm recording this, the exam is a week away, as in seven days away, as in Wednesday of next week. All right, without further ado, I just want to let you know that um, if you haven't already seen the Japanese video, you don't need to leave this video first to go watch this one, but you should watch that one as well if you're having any questions about the German and Italian expansion and how that connects to the, Ita the Japanese expansion or in general Japanese expansion. All right, so I know you're asking yourself, how do I use this information and why do I need to know it? Well, on paper one, you're going to need to know case studies. For us, that is going to be the move to global war is the name of the case studies that you'll need to know. This is going to include German and Italian expansion and Japanese expansion. There are going to be a series of documents that you're going to use to answer four questions, a few with part A and B, but generally it's four questions overall. Now, the first three questions, you're just going to need to refer to the documents and kind of use your brain and a little bit of your background knowledge, but not too much to answer the questions. It's mostly going to be document-based, but that is the backbone. But in question four, you're going to have to uh, write an essay using the documents as support for a claim that you make. Now, this is important to know. It's important to understand the background knowledge for, these, for this particular question because that is where if you have any... Uh, additional knowledge to add, that's really where you're going to get your points there. There's also, I should say, probably going to be a chronology point, there usually is, knowing the uh, order of events or the dates of events. For that reason, in the description is a Dropbox link to the same timeline that we used in the German and or that we used for the Japanese expansion. It is going to include all of the German and Italian expansion uh, events on the same timeline because these two videos line up really well and that the events happen mostly at the same time. It just works out much nicer to talk about German and Italian expansion on its own instead of with Japan because they're on different parts of the world and they're experiencing different events at different times. But you will still see if you watch both videos that a lot of the events in this video connect to the video of last uh, of, of Monday. All right, without further ado, let's just jump right into it and get this done as soon as possible so that you can get on your way, especially since the exam's in one week and you might want some time to practice. All right, World War I in Germany. Now, there's not a lot of background knowledge that you really need to know for the exam, but it is helpful to bring up in some cases. In this case, the really the main thing that you need to know about World War I in Germany is that they had to accept war guilt because of the Treaty of Versailles. This created a lot of uh, nationalism and militarism and kind of built up the idea that, hey, we couldn't stand up for ourselves, we should do better next time. And also the idea that they were being humiliated and uh, knocked down and that the rest of the world didn't treat them as the way they should. And that's going to bring a lot of nationalism into the people because they see themselves as the best or they see themselves as worthy of this praise or attention that they're so clearly not getting because they're being humiliated instead. That's going to be the most important part that you need to take away from World War I in Germany. Of course, if you need to know World War I for either Paper 1 or Paper 2, you need to learn that separately. This is not going to suffice. That little bit of knowledge is only going to help you for the case studies because you don't need a whole lot of background knowledge. Now, now that we've had a lot of uh, shifting in issues in Germany, we have a new onslaught of a new ideology, the Nazi ideology, which is really going to refer to the nationalist ideology. But just say Nazi. That's what everybody wants you to say anyways. All right, the Nazi ideology is going to be very far right, very ultra nationalistic. We talked about nationalism just a moment ago, but it is a, a, an overwhelming pride in one's country. And in this case, it is to an extreme extent. This ideology is based on pseudoscience, specifically the idea that uh, white people are, or the Aryan race or the German Volk, whatever you want to say, they are above all other types of people, especially in this case, uh, Jews. So there's a lot of anti-Semitic um, understanding there. And there's a very, very strong racial hierarchy that is brought in by the Nazis. The Nazis have mm, like three or four main goals. The first of which is to destroy communism, the second of which is to destroy the Treaty of Versailles, and the third of which is to unite the German-speaking people and, in turn, um, gain more land for them to expand because there are a lot of German-speaking people. 
Now, when I say German speaking people, I am talking about the Aryan race. I am talking about the German folk. These are only people who are German by blood. That means that even if you live in Germany and you are a citizen there, if you aren't German by blood in air quotes, then you don't count. All right. There is a very nationalistic response to socialism at this point. They are bringing in Aryan race people from uh, the surrounding areas to try and unify this German Volk. And they're having a lot of Laban Saram. Now, if you need to spell this for your exam, it is L-E-B-E-N-S-R-A-U-M. Laban Saram. But really, this is just going to, perf to refer to pr promoting nationalism sur survival and nationalistic survival by gaining access to land and resources in other, other areas. This is what I was talking about earlier where it refers to like growing space or moving space. It's really going to um, draw in a lot for Poland and the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia. They believed that they were competing against other racial groups for these things. So these areas, they believed they were competing against other, other social groups, other racial groups. And they, because of Le Bonstrom, they wanted to take it for the German folk. They wanted to take it for the Aryan race. We also, at this point, and this is pretty common knowledge, so I won't cover it in depth, but there was a lot of ethnic cleansing, which is the mass expulsion or murder of a single population or a particular cultural or racial group. In this case, we are talking about Jews. Um, you could also argue that we're talking about people who are gay. There are other races or other groups that we are also targeting, but specifically IB wants you to know that we are talk talking about Jewish people because they were the main group that were targeted. Now, if we refer back to the World War I, we know that Wilson made a list of 14 points that really gave Germany the idea that they would be included in the discussion of after-war, post-war life, and they would be treated as an equal member. However, because of the Treaty of Versailles, they were very betrayed because they were obviously not treated as equal, and they were instead given all this war guilt and told that they were the ones who did all the mistakes and it's their fault. So they were really like in a way led on by the, the United States and then really let down at the same uh, time. This, it was at this point that Hitler vowed to destroy communism. Now, of course, we also, when thinking about World War I in Germany, have to understand that there were a lot of economic effects. Germany spent most of the war, uh, most of the time and like energy and money in World War I things. So if there were people at home, they were doing things for World War I. If you were a man, you were fighting in World War I. It was a big deal for Germany. In tandem with the uh, Treaty of Versailles, $33 billion in debt. Um, there was kind of, oh, it, Germany was a little bit overwhelmed. There was a lot of money to make up, especially with this debt and especially with the money that they had spent on the war. The German government encouraged industrial strike protests to which ended up just harming the industrial production and there was a hyperinflation crisis now this is going to bring in the dawa's plan of 1924 and this is in the timeline um but this is when the united states uh bankers or financers gave germany or places in germany loans of money so that they could rebuild and restabilize the economy and hopefully stop this hyperinflation and this was great until the great depression in which case everything that they had worked for uh, fell to pieces. There was a lot of damage and resentment because there was very territorial areas were being very uneven with the way this money was being distributed. Hitler really wanted it to fuel the economy, so he put a lot of money in the cities, but this left suburban areas really, really resentful by the end of the Great Depression or by the, the fall of the country, not the fall of the country, the fall of the economy because of the Great Depression, because they saw that they were still doing okay because they had had this help, whereas the suburban areas were really hit very, very hard. There was a yearn for a more traditional German society because they're seeing all these international issues and they're having all these economic problems as a result from this war that they had just tried to go in. And they see that and they think, well, we want to go back to how things used to be. And this is really what Hitler loved. He fed on this in that he knew that the people and him both wanted a more conservative traditional society. And so he decided to work for that. Um, it also opened the door for very expansionist policies, and it really justified that in the sense that they didn't have any money. And this is a common thread that you also see in Japan. So let's talk about autarky. Autarky is A-U-T-A-R-K-Y, autarky. Autarky is going to be 
<sighs> kind of like the move to be self-sufficient, right? And it's, it's kind of a long drawn out thing, but it is a, a major focus in Germany at this point because they are relying so heavily on other powers and other countries and they are, they're really at a low point. There was payments deficient in 1936 because Germany was importing more goods than it was producing. And it was at this point around here, at least, that we had the Hossbach Memorandum. And this is just a summary of a meeting where Hitler declared his plans to go to war to secure Lebanseram in Eastern Europe, which again is taking over that land and kind of bringing in the resources for Germany. This really increased the pace of radicalism. It's a lot of, um, there is a lot of debate over whether he actually meant this or whether he was just kind of saying it as a, a way to, a way to, how do I say this? Whether he was just using it to scare people or whether he was actually using it as an actual plan. But regardless of what his intentions were, it resulted in a lot of people in office leaving office because they didn't agree with his very radical views. And a lot of people coming in who did agree with those radical views. And when we have a big shift of people towards one ideology, we're going to have a lot of change very, very quickly. And that's what happened. It was a very fast pace of radicalism. There was, at this point, the four-year plan to achieve autarky, which again, that means self-sufficiency, which is really important to, to Germany at this point because they don't have very much self-sufficiency. Self they're, they're importing more goods than they're exporting. They're really, really not doing well for themselves. And so that brings us to kind of the Paris Peace Treaties, which is more on the side of Italy instead of uh, the side of Japan, <laughs> Germany. Um... There was fascism, fascism, oh boy. Um, there was fascism. It was a lot of fascism, actually. It emerged as kind of a ruling government in Italy. And in case you don't know what fascism is, it's an authoritarian um, ideology that has a violent form of imperialism. It's kind of like, it really advocated for a reorganization of the Italian society along like militaristic lines with a one party totalitarianism state and um, kind of war over economic problems. Like everything is solved with the military kind of. Italian fascism in particular was linked to the idea of Italian reunification or unification. Um, it really fell under the sense that it, Italy was incomplete. So it's very, very similar to Germany, the issues that Germany's having at this point. Mussolini did support war very frequently, and uh, Italy suffered high casualties and civilian death rates in World War I as a result of this uh, heavy support. They still kind of won um, in that they were supporting the winning side, but they called it a mutilated victory. That was a phrase by Gabriel De, De, De Anunzio to refer to the disappointing territorial gains of Italy. Uh, even though they had won World War I, they still didn't get much out of it. Um, this guy, by the way, he was a major political figure in World War I. He occupied few and was still trying to take it over. Mussolini agreed that Italy needed to gather some living space, which is the same thing as Germany wanted to do. They wanted to survive and even thrive in this living space, and so they're kind of settled into a dispute between Italy and Ger and Italy and Greece where Mussolini was pinning blame for an assassination on Greece and so Greece gave him some money back and resulted in an Italian quote-unquote victory um, and Mussolini being a hero and this really brought in a lot more of that fascism kind of ideology where we're really stru struggling to get over Mussolini we really support Mussolini he really established himself in the 1920s there was some economic divisions in that there was kind of an internationalist approach to foreign policy till 1922, but this resulted in regional disputes with economy in terms of the, like the wealth distribution because Germany really just made these divides worse and had a very, very small middle class, which is not what you want. You want a, a pretty sizable middle class if you want to have decent economic distribution, but Germany didn't at all. That just means that a lot more people are either very, very poor or very, very rich. There were some economic effects in Italy from World War I as well. 
big increase in unemployment um, because many soldiers were demobilized after the war. They were really trying to release them from the military. And this really caused a high inflation because there were so many unemployed people that food prices started rising uh, above what many could afford because, we, again, we didn't really have a middle class. There was a lot more union memberships, socialist parties, industrial strikes, just a lot of things in general. And so Mussolini decided to come up with his own economic policies. And you will get a kick out of this because all of his economic pl plans were battles. He called them all battles. All right. He really didn't know what he was doing, and I don't say that as a joke. He actually didn't have very much knowledge about the economy, but he wanted autarky, and so he decided to create his economic plans. Anyways, that is the, 1950, the 1925 plan, battle for the grain to incre increase the growth of grain. The 1926 plan of the battle for land, which was to drain marshes and swamps for agricultural land. The 1926 battle for Lena, which was an attempt to push the value of Lina, or sorry, Lira, Lira. Um, Lira was the Italian currency at the time. And the 1927 battle for births, which came to, which was to increase population size. Really, you just need to know that he was battling it up, trying to improve Italy. God, he's a joke. It really just pushed all these problems off onto other, other people, though. It didn't Whatever problems it, 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 these battles did solve, they just created more. Excuse me. All right, so let's talk about the Great Depression. Originally, Mussolini had favored large businesses, very heavy industry, um, but he eventually began trying to try and intervene to create jobs and there was some reconstruction that was really trying to take control of unprofitable comfort companies to increase the number of profitable ones and therefore increase jobs, especially during the Great Depression. This really made it just like a big old government organization. Everything just came under the control of the government. Eventually they controlled steel, iron, merchant shipping, electrical, telephone, everything really there was just because of this plan during the great depression everything was being pulled under the government there were even uh imposed tariffs on foreign goods so let's take a step back for a minute and talk about the league of nations now i did mention the league of nations and their faults in the german in the japanese video um but it's important to mention here as well because it will play a role in these countries so they had Paris peace treaties, which brought on collective security. Collective, collective security was the idea, or the hope at least, that we were all in this together. And I think I said the exact same thing in the last video. We were all in this together and we were all gonna be okay because we were working together and it was all gonna be fine. And um, yeah, well, it wasn't uh, because the United States didn't even sign the Treaty of Versailles because it didn't get through Congress. And it really left the League of Nations as having useless economic sanctions and really in control of Britain and France, who were self-motivated, meaning that the League of Nations wasn't even used to its fullest potential. It was really just used to push the agenda of Britain and France, who were usually on the same side or the same mindset. Um, the League of Nations couldn't hold its own against big, big countries, um, Mussolini and Hitler both despised the League of Nations. Um, they preferred like bilateral and multilateral agreements, meaning that like the nine part, the nine country agreement. So they really liked alliances more so than they liked a big league of nations. Um, it really led to some quite aggressive actions by Germany and Italy. They were both kind of having at this point aggressive foreign policies and really did not like the League of Nations or collective security. That brings us to kind of the if effects of the Great Depression and how that kind of impacted everything. The Great Depression really, really reduced international trade, harming internationalism and collective security. Britain and France were reluctant to impose economic sanctions on Germany because of these issues. And that really let Germany have some more power that they maybe shouldn't have had. Um, the same goes for Italy, but Germany in particular just kind of saw a lot of opportunities and took them. 
They didn't damage their economies at all. Britain wanted to have a very peaceful Europe so they could solve imperial issues and began revising the Treaty of Versailles to be forgiving to Germany, but that didn't happen. France became more concerned with the lack of Anglo-American kind of deals in Europe and wanted bilateral diplomatic and security agreements with the Eastern Europe. So everybody's kind of moving away from the League of Nations at this point, but it is still instated. However, we do have kind of the end of collective security that happens right after Japan invades Manchuria. And again, watch the ja Japanese video if you don't know what I'm talking about because I did talk in depth about the invasion of Manchuria and how that impacted the League of Nations, but let's talk about how it impacted other countries. The League of Nations really failed to deliver proper and adequate, adequate com consequence, meaning that it really couldn't disarm a country. It really resulted in Hitler leaving the World Disarmament Con Conference and League of Nations in 1933. Britain didn't like that France was trying to ally with the U with USSR, and so France objected to Britain's uh, Anglo-German naval agreement that was trying to happen with Hitler, which would have undermined co collective security. Or it did, this action did undermine collective security and it caused friction in Europe. Listen, we're having problems, things are happening, nobody likes it. Originally, they wanted to work with the League of Nations to become more radical, but it didn't. After Abyssinia, which we'll talk about in a minute, collective security uh, slash the League of Nations really pushed away. Appeasement let Germany and France have more time to prepare to deal with Ger with sorry. Anyways, moving on. I don't know what I just said, but ignore it. Um, Really, this did give birth to the Nazi-Soviet Pact of 1939, which was going to be a non-aggression pact between uh, kind of Russia and uh, Germany. So let's talk about the actual events of German and Italian expansion. So we had the first um, main event was the World Disarmament Com Conference, where the League of Nations called for disarmament by 1933, Germany complained that France wasn't being disarmed, and so Germany shouldn't have to either. And so Britain tried to negotiate, and that didn't work. So Germany just left the League of Nations. They were like, yeah, we don't want to be here anymore, and just dipped. This is pretty common. J Japan did that too. They got upset. They just, peace, yo. There was a non-aggression non pact with Poland. Um... Because after leaving the League of Nations, Hitler really began to prefer these bilateral agreements that we had seen Mussolini preferring along the, a long time, um, but not multilateral uh, agreements, which Mussolini still supported, but Hitler saw them as kind of a form of collective security. Um, Poland was worried about not signing this non-aggression pact because they thought they might lose their border and, and be forced to fight as they signed it, even though they weren't really interested in it. So in 1934, we had an attempted Anschluss, which describes an Australian form, Austrian form of assassination. Um, it really, the Treaty of Versailles pr prohibited this because of the Union aspect of everything. Um, it mobilized the Austrian border and Mussolini's threats and actions there dissuaded Hitler, who kind of mutually viewed Mussolini was suspicion at this point. They were both kind of making moves and not really trusting each other on them. And so there was a lot of suspicion between the two groups or the two people rather. We had the German naval agreement at this point, which is um, kind of after Hitler had reintroduced conscription in 1935, they went on to sign an Anglo-German na naval agreement, which essentially had Britain like accepting the German rearmament and um, kind of didn't want the Navy to be more than 35% of what it was before. Britain kind of tried to persuade its citizens that, you know, Hitler was honorable and it was all going to be okay. It was not going to all be okay. It was never going to be okay. And it was not okay. And that brings us to kind of an interesting point here where we have the remilitarization, remilitarization of the Rhineland. And the Rhineland is going to be their... Mm, kind of like their naval base. Not their naval base, just their military base. It's going to be their main source of kind of all military operations. And it had been demilitarized because of the Treaty of Versailles. And of course, that didn't last. And now they were remilitarizing it. 
Um, Italy at this point was uh, invading Abyssinia, which it happens. It happens, guys. It happens. Sometimes we just invade Abyssinia and then don't pay attention to Germany, and that's what happened. And so they said, "Yeah, we can just we can we can just go." And there was kind of like. They wanted to deflect from the fact that they were having all these food shortages and they were like, look, we can remilitarize the Rhineland. And so they did. Um, and it worked. It was, this was uh, 1936. France was pretty outraged and Mussolini began, but Mussolini was like, yeah, I don't, I like that. And began shifting to try and work with Hitler. Um, at this point, we have the Spanish Civil War. If you don't know anything about the Spanish Civil War, uh, I did make a whole video on that, so I'm only exclusively going to be covering how um, Germany and Italy have played a role. If you want more information about the Spanish Civil War, um, there is a video for that in the playlist. Um, so check it out. Um, really, though, everybody else in the world kind of said, yeah, we're not going to play a part in this. We, won't, we don't want to create another world war. And Germany said, yeah, we don't care. And so they interacted in the war anyways and kind of like had a big role in the bombing situation that happened especially with Guernica. Germany supported the nationalists. Shocker, shocker. Uh, they fought against left, uh, like leftists. Hitler wanted to support fellow fascists and, and test new war toys basically and so he did. Um, yeah, it, other countries wanted non-intervention, and Germany didn't care, and Italy didn't care, and the USSR didn't care, and so they went in anyways. Um, German actions did secure the nationalist win in Spain, though. Like, they played a pretty major role. So we also have an alliance at this point with Japan and Italy, although Mussolini previously wanted to, uh, was kind of viewing Hitler with some suspicion, his support during the invasion of Abyssinia changed that, and Rome, there was kind of at this point a Rome-Berlin axis, which was then uh, switched out with the anti-common term, anti term pact, which Germany and Japan both signed. This limited communism and created like communication line between the groups, basically. So we, this is when we kind of bring into this four-year plan to try and achieve autarky. And this is when we have a successful Anschluss. This is when Hitler had continued to not face repercussions for actions. Germany continued to form alliances and the Hossbach memorandum happened. And ever since the first attempt at an Anschluss, the civil unrest in Austria had lingered. And that kind of resulted in Germany having a large set of demands at Austria in order to not go to war. And of course, the leader of Austria resigned because they couldn't handle it. And so Germany rushed in and forced some elections to favor them and kind of use a lot of intimidation to technically properly get on top. This was the first time that uh, Hitler had really aggressively invaded and expanded German territory. We have at this point the Suttadenland um, crisis, which was the Suttadenland was a rich resource rich area of Czechoslovakia close to the German border and of course Hitler loves his resources and so he said that's mine and he kicked up some trouble there he ordered the president to give up the area or to reite re or or to unite with Germany in general um Britain convinced convinced Britain convinced Germany not to go to war after though Germany occupied relatively quickly without giving the Czechoslovakia government too much time to change its borders or to make any sort of an action. Mussolini suggested a conference and wait, this kind of ended with the Munich, no, it didn't kind of end. It did end with the Munich agreement, which gave Germany such on land and immediate occupation of the land. Germany signed a peace treaty with Britain claiming that it was not going to take more land than what it had already done. And of course, that didn't work. It never works. And nothing will ever work. Because then we have the invasion of Czechoslovakia. After Sutlinden, Hitler said, I want more. And so he did. He took more uh, because Czechoslovakia was really weakening. Hungary and Poland had already taken some of the land. And so German troops kind of occupied under the pretense of like restoring order, which was not what they were there to do. 
Uh, it was the first time that Germany took land uninhabited mainly by non-Germans. So previously all of the land they had taken was like very much mainly Aryan race, like German speaking people. And now this was not. And so we have the Polish guarantee now, which was that the invasion of Czechoslovakia marked the end of British and France appeasement. Um, and they kind of acknowledged that Hitler really couldn't be trusted. And so they guaranteed Polish independence. And Hitler uh, didn't like that. And so he began to prepare to invade and challenge the um, Treaty of Versailles by demanding the return of two free cities uh, to them. Because of course, and then we have the Nazi Soviet pact over in the USSR. Stalin was kind of concerned with Germany for a little while from 1838 to 1839. And so he became like convinced that Britain and France were trying to convince Germany to go to war with the USSR, uh, which would be of course bad, bad, bad for Stalin. And so uh, the reason why it would be particularly bad, he had just purged the Red Army and so he was not not quite rebuilt, not quite ready for war. And so Stalin's concerns drove him to signing an agreement with Germany to not attack each other, basically. Um, it really gave Hitler, like, the security to invade Poland because they knew the USSR wasn't going to strike, even though the USSR really had kind of claimed Poland under their um, kind of sphere of influence, just, like, general area that was, like, not their territory, but like basically their territory. And so the fact that they had just signed this agreement not to attack each other meant that Germany really didn't care anymore, went and took the uh, area instead. Anyways, we have now back in Italy, the Stress of Front from 1935. Uh, despite this dispute that they had just had with Greece in 1923, there was some willingness to cooperate in the League of Nations and, and work towards collective security. Um, there was a kellogg briand Pact, uh, signatory nations, which included Italy, denounced war as a means to solve disputes and further uh, foreign policy aims. Like, they just tried to work a little bit better, which is not something that they had done previously. Uh, it stood alongside the League of Nations and really was very suspicious of Hitler at this time. Britain and France and Italy signed the Stress of Front, the Stress of Front in 1935, acted as a uh, protest against like German rearmament and promised to stand against German aggression. After that, though, of course, Germany. After that, though, of course, Italy became more radical, and so it didn't matter anyways that they had done all this like decent stuff, and they were like, yeah, let's not go to war, and then they said, yeah, we don't care anymore, and that's when they invaded Abyssinia. So it had experimented with expansionism, but it really did begin in 1935. It had a, a sort of a presence in Eastern Africa for a long time, but it really liked Abyssinia. And so Abyssinia had like mineral rich deposits and uh, so they forced Abyssinia to accept independence in 1896. And then it wanted to restore the former glory of the Roman empire. And so, they invaded, of course, and there was a border dispute called the Wall Wall Incident, uh, where Mussolini used this kind of incident as an excuse very often onto its actions of invading the entire country. Oh. It announced its intentions to invade, putting a lot of pressure on the League of Nations, who'd already messed up like three or four times at this point, minimum. And, um... The League of Nations was very European-centric, so it didn't care as much about Manchuria as it did about Albacinia, because Albacinia is more in that European realm, whereas, of course, Manchuria was more in the Chinese-Japanese realm. Following the events of the invasion of Albacinia, this really did cause um, the downfall of the League of Nations. There were kind of like trying to buy time and fix the mistakes from Manchuria but of course the compromise that it's instated was necessary and it didn't like that um when it invaded the League of Nations agreed to de-economize de sanctions but this failed because of course the U.S. didn't support it um and they didn't close the Suez Canal so there was some failed fee, failed a failed peace pact that ended up giving, or that would have rather given 
uh, two thirds of Abyssinia, but of course Italy wanted all of Abyssinia. And so um, France kind of backed off because as Germany remilitarized, the Rhineland, um, it really made France very nervous and they wanted to keep Italy as an ally. Um, so it just said, yeah, you can just keep invading. That's okay. And so Italy just left the League of Nations. They were like, yeah, we don't want to do that anymore. Everybody just really got upset and just said, peace, yo. Um, and then we have the invasion of Albania in 1939. Mussolini wanted the region to increase territory and influence so they gave an ultimatum. I'm fine. They gave an ultimatum that would allow it to occupy Albania. News got out sparking anti-Italian uh, protests and spreading of leaflets to encourage surrender. Um, Albania leadership decided to resist. Fighting back, it was very aggressive. I, Italy was very aggressive. There was quick leadership turnover to re reunite with Italy. And Britain kind of promised to protect Romania and Greece at this point. So then we have the Pact of Steel, which really led into World War II, which is where we're going to end our very beautiful story. The Pact of Steel formalized the Roman-Berlin axis, Italy and Germany pledging to support each other in war. It wasn't ready, Italy wasn't ready for war until 1932, despite war breaking down three years earlier in 1939, it just didn't immediately honor the pact, but it still did because it did go to war in 1940. Not fully ready, but felt that they could not wait any longer because they had already been sitting on this pact for a full year. Italian fascism was like militarism and, and, and territorial gains started to happen. Uh, they were concerned with the cost of maintaining neutral kind of bias. And so they just, eh, we like the Mediterranean. We'll start there. And they started there in World War II. So again, at this, the kind of biggest takeaway here is that there was a collapse of collective security because of the actions of specifically Germany and Italy as they were more European based. The actions of Japan probably would have had a bigger role if they were in Europe, but because they were in Asia and the League of Nations was pretty racist, they didn't care as much. They were very European centric. Um, and that kind of brought us into the beginning of World War II. I think I've hit all of the main points that you need to know. Uh, clearly not as much in love with this as I am with Japan. Sorry, it's just not as interesting to me. Um, but we did get through it. Very nice, very nice. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the description. I will try and remember to link the Japanese video in the description of this video so that you can watch that one next. And then we did talk about the Spanish Civil War, so that is also a good video to watch if you have questions about that. Yeah, that's it.